thank you all for coming back on this beautiful day when you should be out in the sun. Thank you for sticking with me through this long journey through climate change and sustainable energy and sustainable transportation. Oh my, I better go to the beginning. Today is the last in the series, Lecture 4. But before we start on Lecture 4, a 30-second review of the main points of Lecture 3 for those who missed it, or those who have forgotten it, or those who would prefer to forget it. <laughs> Why electrify? Well, we learned that transportation is now the most polluting sector of the economy. Burning fossil fuels is cloning the planet through climate change and killing us through air pollution. We looked at the evolution of battery electric vehicles, which from here on I'll call electric cars, because you're more familiar with that term, but I won't talk about hybrids. This will be all complete electric battery electric vehicles. They started in the 19th century and we followed their evolution to the present day. We looked at how quickly or how slowly, depending on your point of view, battery electric vehicles are replacing internal combustion engine vehicles, which is a big mouthful, so I'll call them gas cars, in the US. And we looked at the many ways that uh, electric cars differ from gas cars. So today, we'll continue our discussion, starting with a comparison of electric cars available in the US, which many of you seem to have been interested in, particularly if you're to make, sooner or later, uh, a decision on which electric car to buy. You're also interested in safety, I hope. So we look at the safety of the top selling electric cars. If you want to buy an electric car, you need to know about the charging infrastructure, particularly in the US. I assume you're not going to be driving globally, but that's of some interest too. Boy, isn't it nice to have a good sound system? <laughs> wow. We'll look at the so-called anxieties and myths of driving electric cars. And we'll finish up with a fairly quick slideshow with minimal comment, in fact, probably no comment from me, about the electri electrification of the rest of the transportation system. So let's start with a comparison of electric cars. This looks like a very busy slide, but if you'll bear with me, we'll go through it in a semi-logical fashion. I've divided uh, this table into Tesla, BMW, Chevy Bolt, and Nissan Leaf. Within each category, there may be two or three uh, options, but in each case, they refer to the trim levels and not the performance. So you'll see all the Nissan Leafs have the same performance criteria. I've arranged them in descending order of price. And since your main interest will be in A price and B range, let's just concentrate on these two columns. Normally, you think that uh, you get what you pay for. Unfortunately, there is an exception in this case, and that is the BMW i3, which is the second most expensive car on this list, but has some of the worst performance, particularly the worst range of all of these cars, even uh, with the low end of the, uh, the list. We're promised some increase in range for the i3 next year. So 
I'm going to eliminate this from our discussion until it gets a better, a better range and is more attractive option. And by attractive, I don't mean the look, which, as you know from last week, I thought the i3 was a particularly ugly car. But that's just me. What's left is a true uh, range uh, conforming to the what you see is what you get principle. Starting with the bottom of the list is at 29.9, we have the lowest range and some of the lowest specifications. And we go right up to the top of the Tesla Model 3 long range for 49,000. If you look at the specifications of the uh, Model 3, everything except the price beats the pants off all the competitors. The range is advertised at 310 miles, but the EPA actually rated it at 334 miles. Why did Tesla downgrade it to 310? Because they didn't want it to cannibalize their highest range Model S, which has a range of 335. So you could get more than 310 with a Model 3. Next is the Chevy Bolt, which has quite a respectable range of well over 200 miles. Uh, and uh, in the caboose is the Nissan Leaf with a barely acceptable range. In my book, anything under 200 miles is not really acceptable for long range driving. These uh, characteristics are reflected in the monthly sales. This is a, a table of monthly sales this year from January to September. And as you would expect, even though it's the highest price, uh, incidentally, I was looking only at uh, electric cars under $50,000 because it wasn't fair to uh, compare those with cars costing twice as much. So uh, the Tesla Model 3 Again, beat the competition with over 78,000. Next came the Chevy Bolt with a little over 11,000, the Leaf at a bit over 10,000, and the BMW i3 at a bit over 4,000. Thanks to Bloomberg, I've discovered that the total sales up to yesterday, October 17th, for the Model 3 is over 103,000 which certainly beats the pants off all the competition. This table includes the uh, hybrids, but I've uh, looked at only the uh, electric, fully electric cars, which I've designated by BEV, battery electric vehicle. There's a, a second tier of cars, for which I'll start by looking at only the first two, because they're not yet available. They will be available next year, the base uh, Model 3 for 35,000 MSRP will be available in the first quarter of 2019. The Hyundai Kona EV will also start to be available in the first quarter in California only. Apparently, Kona is having problems with battery supply, and they will not uh, release the Kona in the rest of the country uh, until later, in fact, only in 10 states when they do uh, release the Kona uh, outside California. These are the rest of the cars in Tier 2, and I put them in two, Tier 2 because none of them has an EPA range over 200 miles. Uh, some of them are pretty miserable ranges. The Smart for 2ED has an electric range of only 58 miles. The, uh, the Kona has a really good range, in fact, a better range than the base Model 3 at 258 miles. But the price has not been released yet, so we don't even know if it's less than 50,000. I would imagine it will probably come in around 40, but that's a guess. Again, the sales figures uh, 
reflect these specifications. The only one that has sold more than a thousand units uh, from January through September is the Fiat 500e. These others have less uh, stellar sales records and a few like the, the Ford Focus EV and the uh, Ionic don't even make it onto this top 30 chart. So those are the figures that you would probably interest, be interested in if you were going to make a purchase. If you, well, I've talked about that in a minute. The next criterion that you'd be interested in is safety. And our dear friends at the National Highway Traffic and Safety Administration effectively, affectionately called NHTSA, uh, has rated most of the cars that you can buy, both gas and electric and hybrid. And for some reason, it has never rated the BMW i3. And I've gone back in their records to 2015. No rating for the safety of i3. The, M the Model 3, uh, they say, is the best, safest car they've ever tasted. Tasted. Tested. <laughs> Excuse the verbal confusion. <laughs> That's chemo brain. I put the Model S and the Model X in here because they also have stellar safety ratings. The Chevy Bolt has downgraded a bit on the frontal crash test, only four out of five stars but five out of five on the side crash and rollover. The Nissan Leaf, in keeping with its lowest price, has four stars across the board. NHTSA has also rated uh, the tested cars on probability of injury. These are the top 50 safest vehicles since they started testing in 2011. And of all of these 50 uh, vehicles, the top one is the Tesla Model 3, close behind is the Model S and the Model X. All of these other 48, 47, sorry, uh, come uh, a little shorter. So there are your criteria for making a decision. Since you probably are not going to buy, like our friends in Dallas, tomorrow, I encourage you to uh, check out all of those things that I've just talked about a little closer to when you make your decision. But having purchased an electric car, you need to know how to charge it. So let's talk a little bit about the charging infrastructure. And the most important message you need to take away is that for most people, at least 90% of charging is done at home. And there are three main ways to charge at home. If you're fortunate enough to own a Tesla, you can get what they call the high power wall connector, shown here, which uses AC current like all of your home chargers. Uh, but you have to connect it to a 100 amp circuit because it charges at 72 amps, a uh, 50 cent amp, amp circuit won't work. And this gives you 59 miles of range per hour of charging. This is the standard dryer outlet, which you can have installed in your garage or just outside your garage if you park outside. Uh, this is also alternating current, 240 volts. You can connect this to a 50 amp circuit but it charges about half the rate of the high power wall connector. And this is the humble 110 volt domestic power outlet with a pretty slow rate of charge. But remember that A, your car is packed in your garage overnight, most of the time for about 12 hours. Uh, and uh, B, you don't often drive more than 40 miles in a day. 12 hours of charging in one of these gives you 60 miles. So for most of your driving, you could even plug into a 110 uh, outlet and be fine. 
10% of your charging is usually done away from home unless you drive professionally or you're a retiree that does long trips all the time. So you'll want to know how to charge away from home. Again, if you're fortunate enough to own a Tesla, you can use the Tesla supercharger network and I'll show you their distribution. This is the fastest charging method currently available in the US. It'll give you 150 miles of range in as little as 20 minutes of charging. This is DC current. Um, if you charge at home on AC, you have to make use of the inverter in the car. But DC charge from superchargers bypasses the inverter in the car, goes straight to the battery, so it charges much faster. There are supercharger sites with anywhere from four, I think four is the smallest, and that's in uh, Kamloops, British Columbia, and I've charged there often, uh, through uh, the maximum in the US, uh, several 40 stall sites, and in China, 250 stall sites. This is the map of the supercharger network in North America. The red dots are all the ones that are currently functioning, and the little gray dots will be functioning soon. You can drive from Edmonton, Alberta, to southern Mexico entirely on superchargers, provided you drive a Tesla. You can drive all the way down the west coast. You can drive all the way across country at several levels, all the way from uh, northern Quebec down to the tip of Florida, again, just on superchargers. If you want to drive in Europe, you can rent a, a Tesla in Europe and drive pretty much everywhere in Western Europe. Similarly, in Asia, um, the uh, supercharger sites in Asia are going up as, about as fast as uh, in the US because they're about to build a Tesla factory in uh, uh, China and uh, make Teslas there to avoid the 25% tariff on imported cars. Japan is pretty well covered. In Australia, the populated areas are pretty well covered. This and this is where 80% of Australians live and pretty much the whole of New Zealand is covered. And if you want to drive a Tesla in the Middle East, you can drive even in Dubai and the United Arab Emirates. The leading country for superchargers per million inhabitants is Norway, which is way ahead of everybody else. Uh, almost three times as many as Sweden, four times as many as Denmark, and five times as many per head of population as the United States. Some people don't live at home and don't have garages, but they live in apartments or condominiums. So Tesla is installing what they call urban area DC chargers, relatively fast, but again, not as fast as superchargers. Uh, and they're installing them in urban malls and public parking areas. So apartment uh, and condo dwellers do have a place to charge. If you stay at a resort or a hotel, Tesla has installed a whole bunch of high-power wall connectors at what they call destinations, hotels and resorts, uh, about the same as the dryer outlet in your garage as far as charging speed is concerned. And here is Tesla's map of all the destination charges. As you can see, there is a bunch of them. Again, you need a Tesla, but if you don't have a Tesla, all is not lost. If you go to plugshare.com, you can see where all of the non-Tesla DC fast chargers are. And again, they have uh, a charging speed about half of a high power wall connector.
and the level two charges that PlugShare.com will tell you, uh, which are equivalent to uh, a um, um, dryer outlet, uh, are pretty well distributed also, even up into Alaska and down into Mexico. There's a total of 18 proprietary networks that run all these non-Tesla chargers. And for most of them, you have to sign up to get an account so they can charge you, because none of this is free. The only free charging is for legacy Tesla owners on the Tesla network. But it's important to note that charging is always much less expensive than uh, filling a, a gas car uh, with gasoline. You've all heard of Dieselgate, for which Volkswagen had to pay a 2.8 billion fine for rigging diesel-powered vehicles to cheat on emissions tests. And they have to use that money to install electric vehicle infrastructure around the US. Remember, it's always cheaper, even if you ha have to pay to charge electrically, than if you have to fill up a gas car with gas. OK, let's move on to what critics call the anxieties and what I often call the myths of electric cars. You've probably all heard of range anxiety. There's no excuse for range anxiety if you drive a Tesla. You may have range anxiety if you have a, a non-Tesla electric car with less than 200 miles of range. I've listed here all of the full electric cars, battery electrics, available currently in, in the US, except for three here, which won't be available until next year. Of all of these uh, cars, I've separated those with a range of over 200 miles by this black line uh, from those under 200 miles. And if you don't plan to drive outside your local area, most of these will work. If you do plan to drive outside your local area, I strongly recommend a car with more than 200 miles of range. And at the moment, uh, out of the uh, 10 cars with over 200 miles of range, nine of the ones that are currently available are Teslas. Only the Chevy Bolt has a range of over 200 miles, although the uh, Kona Electric will be uh, joining that club next year. If you drive a Tesla, the reason that you don't have range anxiety is as follows. Superchargers are installed every 80 to 150 miles along most highways. And all Teslas have a range of over 200 miles, so no sweat. The car will even tell you if you don't have enough range to get to the supercharger site you're aiming for. And if you don't have enough range, it will tell you some alternatives. It will even tell you how many stalls are free at the supercharger site that you're aiming for while you're on your way there. And it will tell you how much charge you'll have when you arrive, even before you get there. And while you're charging, it will tell you how much you charge, how much you need to charge to get to the next supercharger so you don't overcharge and waste time. So if you have a Tesla, no excuse for range anxiety. Even with a car that has a range of under 200 miles, if you plan appropriately, you should never have range anxiety. Now, the, the critics say this will make you stop every, well, couple of hundred miles, or at the most, 400 miles. And I want to drive more than 400 miles at a stretch. Why should I have to stop? 
This is why you should have to stop. <laughs> Deep vein thrombosis and pulmonary embolism, shown here in a diagram and here in an ultrasound test, which shows a, a thrombus in a, a deep vein in the calf. Sometimes these clots break away and wash into your lungs where they can block the pulmonary arteries. If they're large enough, they'll block the pulmonary artery completely and then it's all over. To avoid, or at least help avoid, deep vein thrombosis, drink plenty of water if you're going on a long trip. Get up and walk around at least every couple of hours. And I recommend wearing compression stockings. I get uh, to walk around every couple of hours and I still wear compression stockings. How common are deep vein thromboses and pulmonary embolism? You'll be surprised. Approximately 300 to 900,000 cases of DVT occur in the US every year and 60,000 to 100,000 people die therefrom. The next anxiety that people who don't own electric cars complain about is temperature anxiety. When it gets cold, you lose range, which is very true. In fact, in extreme cold, you can lose quite a lot of range, up to 30 to 40% if you're driving in sub-zero weather. But you can mitigate this problem with a few tips. You can preheat your car when you wake up in the morning by pulling out your cell phone, going to the Tesla app and telling your Tesla to warm up while it's still plugged in in the garage, which I do every time I drive in winter. I think you can do that with non-Tesla cars too. You can use the seat heaters rather than heating your whole car, which saves a lot on electricity. And you can drive more slowly, which you need to do in sub-zero anyway, unless you're a raving lunatic. <laughs> Last time I looked, Norway had cold winters. But Norway has the highest percentage of electric car sales of any country in the world they have reached a record of 48% of total vehicle sales uh, represented by electric cars, which is amazing. I've already mentioned charge time anxiety. I don't want to sit at a supercharger even, charging when I could be driving. Well, I have to remind you again about local driving, for which you need to charge only in your garage. It takes me five cents to plug into my uh, outlet in the garage. Five seconds. Did I say five cents? Five seconds. Uh, and if I plug in only once a week, which I'm perfectly entitled to do, that takes me four minutes a year. <laughs> if I plug in every day, that takes me a total of 30 minutes a year. Charge time while you're parked in, the, in your garage doesn't count because you're not sitting there waiting for it to charge. Critics often uh, forget about the time they spend filling their car with gas. In Oregon, it takes longer than in other states because you often have to wait for a free pump and an attendant to use the pump to fill your car. And you often have to go into the kiosk or the um, um, place where they sell snacks to pay and then you have to drive back to where you are going. If you only fill up once a month, you can spend more than two hours a year. Uh, if you spend only 10 minutes at your gas station, or as long as more than 12 hours a year, uh, if you fill up uh, once a week and take as long as 15 minutes at the gas station. For long distance driving, this is how much longer it takes me on a 600-mile trip, which I do 1,200-mile uh, trips about three times a year. On a 600-mile one-way trip, 
in a gas car, it used to take me 12 hours. In my Tesla, it takes me 13 hours. Why only one extra hour? Because everything that I need to do other than charge, have coffee, go to the restroom, buy lunch, they are all done while I'm charging. Whereas those things take time after you finish gassing up. Okay, now we're going to have a, a fast slideshow without any commentary for me. I'm going to rely on the fact that you're awake enough to read the captions, <laughs> because the captions are all you need. Remember the $3 million Bugatti Chiron we spoke about last week? The Tesla Semi has a better drag coefficient. Bearing is the side pieces that make it more aerodynamic. This is a big benefit compared with that. Take a look at that warranty. Compared with that. This is the really attractive part for tracking companies. A dollar twenty six per mile versus a dollar fifty one per mile, even if you don't platoon. Zero poisonous emissions is important for the mining industry. These figures are interesting. The old London cab. Even Dubai. This is something you may not have thought about. Will not tip over, even when it's hit from the side by a car. Here's some homemade stuff from Eugene. This is uh, marketing stuff. Don't strain your eyes reading that. Even the humble bicycle. You may not have thought a lot about electric boats either. Around the world. This is currently going around the world. This should be a period. This is the European for 4.3.
even putting solar panels in the sails. Boy, is there no limit to what people will go to, no limit to the lengths people will go to. Not only solar, but wind. Makes sense if you're sailing. This doesn't make a lot of sense, except you can sail right into the wind with this dude. <laughs> Even ships. There's an interesting statistic. This was way back in 2014. Look at the savings. Norway has these huge oil reserves in the North Sea, and yet they are right on the forefront of electric transportation. You all remember these in World War Two. You all have one of these, I assume. <laughs> and you've all seen trains that run on overhead uh, uh, electric wires. That's not new. But you may not have seen the third and fourth rail in uh, London. This is very new. In fact, not yet available, but if Elon Musk has anything to say about it, will be in a couple of years. At really high speeds, up to 760 miles an hour. Faster than a jet. Just below the speed of sound. Even planes. Who would have thought? One of the motivations for getting into electric air transportation is getting away from avgas for these reasons. Here's this electric plane compared with two F gas burning Cessnas. Look at the difference in climb rate here. And the electric plane is half the price or less. It has five world records and it will fly for up to two hours. This is a little far into the future, but I have no doubt that eventually we will see air transportation like this. And this. In fact, this sort of thing is imminent. 17-mile range is not a, a lot, but it'll take you from the airport to uh, downtown. That's all, folks. I have miraculously left seven minutes for questions. In order to leave seven minutes for questions, I threw out a large number of slides. You'll be happy to know. Hi, uh, my name is Sally, 
here. Right. Um, how much does it cost to uh, load up your car electricity with electricity? It depends on where, <coughs> where in the country you live. In your home? Oh, in your home. Well, it depends on where in the country you live because uh, domestic charging rates or domestic electric rates in dollars per kilowatt hour vary a lot. Um, one of the most expensive parts of the country is San Diego, I discover, which is um, something like 26 cents per kilowatt hour. Uh, in Oregon, we used to pay 11 cents per kilowatt hour, but it's gone up a little bit since then. Well, it depends what your range is. Uh, if you have a car like mine with a 335 mile range, to go from zero to 100% um, would take a lot more than what I usually charge at, which is 15% to about 60%. I didn't show a slide that tells you that once you get over 50% uh, of battery charge, your charge rate slows down a bit. So um, I don't need more than, usually more than 50%. I give myself a little extra cushion. But you have to decide that uh, depending on A, the range of the car you buy, and uh, B, how much time you have in your garage before you need to use the car again, and C, what your electric rates, excuse me, are. It's always a lot cheaper than filling up a gas car. Thank you, Peter. This is Janet. Uh, an issue for states and federal highway systems is how to pay for roads, and that most of it's gone the gas tax now, and uh, electric cars don't pay any gas tax. They tried here a surcharge on registrations when electric cars first came out, and people didn't like that. But any ideas there? So in some states, they pay a high registration fee for electric cars. Uh, as you say, Oregon pioneered a um, mileage-based uh, charge. Um, and I participated in that um, at one stage uh, when I had a gas car. Um, but uh, that's a work in progress. Um, it'll be a problem when everybody has an electric car, and I'm sure the government will find some way to charge us. Peter, this is Virginia. Um, obviously, you did an incredible amount of research to do these fabulous programs that you've done for us. Thank you. When you decided to switch to an electric vehicle, and you ended up with Tesla, which you obviously are very, very fond of. What sort of research did you do in making that decision? I looked at my son-in-law's car, <laughs> which was the, <laughs> the only electric car that was available at the time. This was back in 2013. Uh, I was skeptical at first. Uh, the technology was a little overpowering and that huge screen, you've probably seen the 17-inch screen in the Model S. Uh, I thought that might be distracting, but the more I rode in it and the more I drove it, uh, I actually got to drive it, thank you, son-in-law, the more I realized that this was a revolution in transportation. And like almost all Tesla drivers, I will never go back to a gasoline car. Dave here. I uh, had a question on one of the slides you showed, the 110 uh, volt uh, pl standard house plug-in, like we've got here along the wall, and but you had 40 amps against that plug. But uh, a number 12 wire is rated at 20 amps, so I'm just wondering, would you have to rewire up to that, or is was that a an error in the slide? Well, I'll let you a dirty little secret. I charge at 110 because I rarely drive more than 40 miles in a day and my daughter and son-in-law's Teslas hog the, ga the, the dryer outlet. Uh, but I don't need uh, more than 110 volt. And uh, our 
uh, garage, 110 bon outlet, bolt outlet, uh, is uh, uh, plugged into uh, a 40 amp circuit. Now, if, if you buy a, um, a more modern Tesla, that is capable of charging at 72 amps. So you need 100 amps. You can never charge at the full amp rate. Uh, to charge at 40 amps, you need a 50 amp circuit. To charge at 72 amps, you need a 100 amp circuit. Uh, we, uh, I could charge at a 100 amp circuit, uh, at 72 amps on a 100 amp circuit, but I don't need to. So I'm happy to charge on 110. But we didn't have to modify our uh, 110 outlets at all. Hi, this is Casilla. Uh, we own a Model S, and um, to answer, yeah, to My answer Sally's convert. question, frankly, and we put in a, a dryer outlet <coughs> charger, and we charge once every mm, two weeks at most, something like that. And I would say that since I pay the electrical bills, I have noticed no change in the electrical bills at all. I mean, in, in terms of maybe a dollar or two, actually less than my housemate leaving all the lights on in the house all of the time. <laughs> so, you know, they're, they're incredibly inexpensive. And then of course we're a legacy Tesla, so we get to charge at the superchargers for free for life. So that helps quite a bit. So I kidded you not. Uh, this is Meredith. Hi. This is Eunice. And I just have a curiosity question about the Scandinavian countries. Um, does Saab or Volvo make these electric cars? The Volvo makes an electric car, but it's, uh, I don't think it's available in the US and it sells in very small volumes. All, all uh, in the US, uh, it would sell in small volumes too, because uh, Volvo makes hybrid cars. I don't know that it makes uh, a battery electric, full electric car. Um, in fact, I'm pretty sure it does not sell a full electric in Europe. Uh, this is Meredith. I was wondering about, uh, as more and more people go electric car, what about vandalism um, at charging stations? D do you need any human monitoring? I mean, gas stations have human personnel. Is there a vandalism problem? That's an excellent question. Uh, I have not heard of any vandalism. At, uh, I lie. I've heard of one case of vandalism at a charging station about three or four years ago. What is a bigger problem is what's called icing. That's when an internal combustion engine car parks in a charging uh, stall. And that's a, a much bigger problem than we would like to see. Um, in fact, some Tesla owners have printed little signs that they leave on the windshield of cars that do that to encourage them to Get the heck out of there. <laughs> but I don't think vandalism, so far at least, has been a problem. So this is Lucy. Um, a question about mountainous terrain mm -hmm. and the estimation on that's showing on your display on your car of how that will impact your range. Um, does it? It takes that into account. Um, there are two ways of taking that into account. The, the Tesla will automatically take that into account because uh, it uses um, uh, GPS and uh, highway mapping. But there's also a website called EV Trip Planner that was put together by a high school student with some help from his dad, uh, which actually tells you the elevation gain on your trip and also takes it into account. You do lose some range if you do a lot of elevation gain. But um, every year I go up to British Columbia and I always take the Coquihalla Expressway, which is one of the highest uh, roads in North America. And uh, 
I I don't lose very much range. One last question. I was wondering, I was told that the $50,000 car would have almost $15,000 worth of stuff from the state of Oregon and the federal government in rebate stuff. Um, I'd like to uh, uh, take a small amount of credit for that because I, I lobbied uh, the governor hard to allow credit for electric vehicles, both hybrid and full electric. And uh, I was absolutely astonished when she signed a bill that uh, allowed a $2,500 tax credit for electric vehicles worth $50,000 or under, which is fair. Uh, if you buy a more expensive car, you probably don't need the tax credit. Uh, and the federal tax credit uh, is $7,500, uh, which starts decreasing when each manufacturer has uh, sold uh, 200,000 cars. Tesla's already passed that limit, and it's in the uh, cool-down phase. Uh, for the next two quarters, it will continue $7,500, but the two quarters after that, it drops to $3,750, uh, and then two quarters after that, it drops again to half, and then finally peters out. Um, other states have actually better um, incentives than Oregon. California has up to $7,000 under certain conditions. Uh, Colorado has $5,000. Uh, so um, before you make your decision, look at the tax credits in operation at the time, and you may or may not get a nice surprise. I bought early enough to get the, the full federal tax credit, but I would not have been eligible for the state since my car cost more than uh, $50,000. Peter, I'm afraid we're out of time, but thank you very much for such a well-researched presentation.